Hi everyone, my name is Sam and on behalf of Book Soup, I'd like to thank you all for joining us for today's event for Indies First with Paul Haddad to discuss Freewaytopia, how freeways shaped Los Angeles. Freewaytopia is part colorful lore, part civic and historical critique, and part homage to the most famous freeways in the world. Tonight's event will end with a Q&A, and to submit a question, please use the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen. If you see a question on the list you'd like for our speaker to answer, please click the Like button, and we will try to answer as many questions as time will allow. And please also feel free to engage with the conversation and each other in the chat area because we're virtual. It's nice to know you're with us. Um, so we'll be hosting more virtual events in the near future. And you can learn more about them on our website by signing up for our email newsletter. And you can follow us on social media at BookSoup. And you can follow our Crowdcast page right here for direct notifications. And past events are also available on our YouTube channel. Please support Book Soup and our author tonight by purchasing a copy of tonight's featured book. Um, it's not only Indies First, but it's also nearing the holidays. So if you want to um, get, you know, books for gifts or anything else, it's a good time to shop early thanks to everything that's happening in the world. And you can do that by clicking the green button right below the viewer screen. It'll redirect you to our website where you can complete the checkout process. And we are going to have signed copies. So as far as I know, this is the only place you can get signed copies of Freewaytopia. So take advantage while you can. And we're also selling digital audiobooks and ebooks through Libro FM and Kobo for those interested. And we're also open for in-store browsing. So if you came by today and you're here right now, thank you so much for supporting Book Soup. And um, if you want to come at another time or if you're local to Los Angeles, we are open daily from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. So we would love to see you and come say hi. And with that said, let me introduce our guest for this evening. Paul Haddad's books include the Los Angeles Times bestseller, 10,000 Steps, A Day in LA, 57 Walking Adventures, and High Fives, Pen and Drives, and Fernan Fernando Mania, a fan's history of the Los Angeles Dodgers glory years, 1977 to 1981, which was named one of the best baseball books of 2012 by the Daily News. As a Hollywood-born native, he has written about Los Angeles for the LA Times and hosted a column on Huffington Post about LA's forgotten history. He has authored three award-winning novels, including The L.A. Noir, Paradise Palms, Red Menace Mob. A graduate of University of Southern California School of Cinematic Arts, Haddad has been nominated for multiple Emmys as a documentary producer. And you can find more at paulhaddadbooks.com and on social media at L.A. underscore dorkout. And without further ado, I'm going to turn the camera over to Paul. And thank you so much for being with us. And I'm going to hang out, too, because I'm going to be um, talking freeways today. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Sam, for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah, so um, this book was born out of uh, the fact that it really the impetus for me was the fact that there was there were no books about Los Angeles freeways ever published um, in the sense that they went into the history and gave you some context about all the major freeways in Los Angeles. Uh, there, there have been you know, there was one book that came out in the early '80s that was kind of an appreciation of freeways, kind of a photo essay, which is a really good book. And then freeways have been talked about in some of the more academic books, like books from Mike Davis, City of Courts, authors who I idolize, frankly. But I found that like this was kind of filling this void that also dovetail with my obsession with freeways. It goes back to when I was a little kid. So it was kind of a labor of love for me to, to write it. Um, and really, you know, what I wanted to um, do with this book was to not just go into the history of the major freeways in the Los Angeles area, but unveil something about Los Angeles itself. Because by telling the story of LA's freeways, you're essentially telling the stories of Los Angeles through much of the 20th century and both good and bad. And, uh, you know, that can involve the displacement of people who um, by eminent domain had to leave their neighborhoods uh, or, you know, just some of the architectural wonders of the four level interchange and uh, these kind of accolades that freeways got in putting LA on the map, um, bringing it into the space age. And also these freeways that uh, were emblazoned across some um, postcards that went uh, around the world that I remember being able to see um, at LAX or farmer's market. Um, so that said, you know, that's kind of the setup for what prompted the book. Um, there's, 
if you pull up the, there's a map that covers in the very first part of the book, um, what the, what the freeways are that I talk about in Freeway Topia. Um, many of them we know, if you're a native here, you know them from their names, the Ventura Freeway, the San Diego Freeway, the Hollywood Freeway. Uh, but then there's some that we just call by their numbers and some of them we just call by both. Um, I wanted to focus on freeways that went through the city of Los Angeles. So that means you won't really be reading about the San Bernardino Freeway, which lies mostly east of, of downtown or the 710, which uh, certainly factors into Los Angeles County, but not in the city of Los Angeles. And, you know, that also means because I'm focusing mostly on those freeways that lie in Los Angeles, the little Marina Freeway, which spans all of two and a half miles is, is uh, gets its own chapter. Uh, and along with the San Diego Freeway, which is 150 miles of, you know, about 70 of which go through LA or 60, maybe less. Um, so that was kind of, um, how I broke down the chapters and, um, then, you know, by really the starting with the oldest freeway, the Arroyo Seco, uh, which you can see there in that one picture leading into the Harbor Freeway. Um, I started, of course, with that because that's the first freeway in Los Angeles and in really the Western United States. Um, and then it ends with the Century Freeway, which uh, comes later. You know, that's the last chapter and it was the last freeway built. Um, and here we see the Hollywood Freeway, which was really the first modern freeway in Los Angeles and that it was not a parkway, but it was a freeway meant to get people from point A to B as quickly as possible. Whereas the Arroyo Seco Parkway, which opened a couple of years before the Hollywood Freeway, was really more of a parkway that wanted to not just get people from downtown to Pasadena in an efficient manner, but also in a way that um, was pleasing to the eyes that had the city beautiful movement behind it and a lot of Beaux Arts bridges and increased your physical and mental welfare while driving it. So it was considered like a, you know, a jaunt through the countryside. We don't really say that about the Hollywood Freeway. Um, so that's kind of the setup, you know, the, these 12 different freeways, each getting their own chapter. And um, I think what's very uh, top of mind right now with a lot of people um, is the displacement, the displacement of individuals in Los Angeles because of these freeways being built through their neighborhoods. And one reason it is so top of mind right now is because of the infrastructure bill that Washington passed. And as part of that uh, infrastructure program, um, there has been talk about decommissioning freeways or at least righting the wrongs of communities that were displaced, many of them low income or people of color. And in the Los Angeles area, uh, that would mean somehow compensating um, people in Boyle Heights or um, where the 10 goes through South Los Angeles um, at the time when um, the Hollywood Freeway was being built, for example, um, there was a house that belonged to this woman in 1948. Uh, this house was on the uh, kind of on Boylston, it was on Boylston Street, and this house was moved. Many of the houses were moved and not displaced or not, excuse me, not destroyed. But when the houses were moved, they were often kind of ruined uh, or they, there was a lot of repair work that needed to be done by the owners when they moved the houses a couple miles away to their new location. And there have been stories of people whose houses were moved for one freeway and they moved to a new location and then they had to move yet again for another freeway. Uh, that came across my research more times than I care to even, you know, think uh, or that I thought would happen, but it happened several times um, throughout the building of freeways. Uh, what I like about this photo is this woman in the front portal area, you can see her standing there. She's wearing like a white house dress and she's refusing to move off her front porch as the house is being jacked up and being ready to move. <laughs> so she was just being taken for a ride. I, I don't know if she ever got off that front porch, but she's defiantly standing there. Um, but on the other hand, then there's more heartbreaking pictures like this 83 uh, year old woman. Um, her name was, uh, trying to get the name of her. I think it was Margaret Vaz, Margaret Vose, V-O-Z-E, 83 years old, living on a stretch of olive that is gone now. It's North Olive. Uh, only South Olive exists now through downtown Los Angeles. So this would have this would have been near the Civic Center. And uh, she was a widow 
she just had her dog and was very settled in there and really w was trying to ward off the highway barons by holding up this uh, cross to them and praying. Um, so th the, the book does include about 175 photos. Uh, many of them are very rare photos and they include maps from Caltrans who uh, cooperated with me on the writing of this book. Uh, many of them are from the Los Angeles Library Collection, uh, UCLA. This one was from the old Herald Examiner newspaper in Los Angeles. Um, uh, what you also, uh, what the book also includes are photos of uh, meetings where Caltrans, now called Caltrans, back then it was the Highway Commission or the Division of Highways, they would conduct meetings at different communities. So uh, one such meeting was in 1947. Uh, it was for the building of the um, Harbor Freeway. And these were people who were trying to make sure the Harbor Freeway didn't go through their section in South Los Angeles. And uh, Kenneth Hahn was then council person for that district, eventually became a, um, a member of the, the County Board of Supervisors. Unfortunately, they lost that battle as many people did because in the 50s and 60s, you generally did not ever beat the highway commission or the, the freeway lobby, as it were. Um, we have another photo here of people in the valley, in the Northwest Valley, who are uh, demonstrating against the Whitnall Freeway, which would have gone along Roscoe Boulevard, um, if you go to the next photo. And that was a freeway that has a long and strange history. It is a freeway that would have gone through actually starting up Highland and going under the Hollywood sign and coming out where Forest Lawn uh, Cemetery is now and then running northwest through the library, through, through the valley, excuse me, and running westward along Roscoe Boulevard and then dipping south uh, through Topanga Canyon to Malibu. So it would have done like a giant U through the LA basin. I mean, a pretty crazy uh, proposed freeway plan. Uh, we'll get to that later, some of the freeways that were never built, including the Whitnell Freeway. But these were homeowners in the Northwest Valley in the mid 60s who were protesting against the possibility of the Whitnell Freeway going through the mid Valley area. Um, they won in this case. And uh, as a result, the Simi Valley Freeway got built. And then south of that, the Ventura Freeway, those are the two West East freeways going through the valley. But they were able to nix the um the Whitnell freeway going through the mid valley straddling roscoe boulevard and i would point out here uh this is an example of a largely white population successfully pushing off the freeway lobby from building a freeway through their backyard not so much the case in boyle heights bunker hill sugar hill which was the black community um near south los angeles where the 10 went through you know, you find time and time again, freeways were built in these, uh, you know, dense neighborhoods, largely low income, people who didn't have much sway with City Hall. And um, yet the Beverly Hills Freeway, uh, the Whitnell Freeway, the Reseda Freeway, many of these did not get built because they had constituents who could successfully fight off um, freeways getting built. So that's uh, bringing it back home again to what the infrastructure bill in Washington is trying to address, which is trying to find a way to repair some of these communities that were driven apart by freeways uh, to this day that, you know, our, their identity was kind of just cleaved in half from freeways. Boyle Heights being a perfect example. Um, and then speaking of the valley, uh, this next map here really shows why there were freeways being built, um, spoking outward from downtown Los Angeles. You can see that kind of white zone in the middle there, that's where there are no suburbs. That's the old section, the old central section of Los Angeles. And then you see these patches of gray uh, surrounding that middle area. And those were, that's where suburbs were being built and where the population was increasing. And this map is from 1953. So following those population trends, um, Caltrans was building freeways to the valley to the west side, to the South Bay. And um, you can see a, a large pocket of gray there in the upper north uh, west area. And that's where the valley, where people were settling into the valley because after World War II, the valley's population doubled in 10 years. 
In fact, I think by 1960, it was 750,000 people living in the Valley, uh, which would have been on par with uh, St. Louis, the city of St. Louis. It would have been the 10th largest city in the United States if it was its own city. So you can see the Hollywood freeway creeping up there in the middle of the of this map. It's that diagonal line that is kind of pointing northwest. That's where the Hollywood freeway ended in 1953. And it would eventually link up with the Ventura freeway, you know, the 101. And uh, it would run alongside the south, uh, the southern boundary there of where you see all those suburb pockets up in the uh, northwest there. Um, but, uh, you know, it, continue this theme of um, of kind of where the whiter or more affluent residents uh, lived. Um, the, the last uh, picture I want to show here from displaced residents was of this woman known as the Golden State Granny. And her name is Lami Puckett. She was a homeowner in the Silver Lake area and uh, lived near where the five freeway was going to go through her duplex, which the freeway builders said they would have to tear down. This was in 1958. And she wasn't going to have it. She was from Texas and knew her way around a gun, a rifle. Uh, she was married to a police officer um, who had recently died. And she claimed she could shoot the head off a rattlesnake from 30 paces. And she was known as the Golden State Granny. And her picture was plastered around the, the United States on newspapers because there was a kind of a reckoning happening of like, well, what what were we doing about these uh, displaced widows? And um, so it took this uh, white grandma to really make this front page news around the nation. And she had a standoff with her rifle for two months on her front porch. She wouldn't move. Wow. And finally, she was duped off her porch. Her son as well, his name was Ross. He was he was standing sentry when she was uh, going to sleep at night. So there was always someone there. And uh, she was duped off by someone posing as a reporter, but it was a sheriff's deputy who handed her a writ that said they can take over her house. Uh, she went to court. She lost. She said she wanted to get $15,000 for a house. The state gave her $8,000. And the postscript to this story is um, she wasn't as innocent as we thought. She owned 18 rental units in the area, and she was basically just hanging out at one of her rental units. She didn't really even live there, one of her vacant units. Wow. Um, so yeah, she had multiple rental units. She was very well off. And in fact, when the freeway tore down her duplex, her son Ross ended up working for the highway department. And guess what his job was? He was the head of the rights away department, eviction department, um, the eviction division. That was wow. kind of, you know, ironic um, coda to her story, Lamy Puckett. I was going um, to ask you why you think, like what bigger, or like what, the, you know, obviously people don't want to be removed from their homes and displaced, but if they saw like the future of more cities and were resisting city life, um, but then when you tell her whole story, I'm like, oh, well, she's a landlord, so <laughs> she wanted her money. She, she, was, she was a businesswoman. She yeah. wanted more money. She was trying to hold out for more money. And, and uh, she saw the um, her story benefited her. There were about 100 different media members parked out in front of her house many days. And uh, it became one of those daily um, stories that uh, everyone was reporting on. And she thought that press would help her maybe make the freeway uh, builders build around her house, maybe. Or just I think she was holding out for more money. And mm -hmm. uh, the funny thing was when she went to trial, the judge asked her, well, why do you think your house is worth $15,000, your duplex? And she said, well, it was beautifully built. And, and look, they tore it down, so I don't have it as proof anymore. So you just have to take my word for it. <laughs> she wanted to offer it as an exhibit. Wow. Yeah. Um, so you had these freeways. Once they did open, there was a lot of fanfare. And so what my book also gets into is all the grandeur and pageantry and pomp and circumstance behind the opening of freeways, which you know, let's face it, the 1950s, 60s was kind of the go-go era of progress. And, um, you know, having big splashy openings was a way to signal to the world that LA was open for business and freeways were the answer to traffic. Uh, I hate to spoil the ending, but they weren't, um, as we all know. 
But it started with the Arroyo Seco Parkway, and in the middle there was Sally Stanton, who was, um, she was the Rose Parade Queen in 1940, 18 years old. Um, she established a template of the freeway builders using beauty queens to help open freeways with oversized scissors and with politicos, you know, the governor, the mayor, uh, highway patrolmen, other, you know, mucky mucks who could um, dress up the, the ribbon cuttings. And this was the first, one of the first ribbon cuttings of a freeway. Um, the funny thing is the next picture actually is a ribbon cutting that happened prior to the Arroyo Seco Parkway. This is the Hollywood Freeway, which the entire freeway opened after the Arroyo Seco Parkway. But this particular stretch, this ushered in cars through Coanga Pass. And that section opened before the Arroyo Seco Parkway opened. Um, and what you see here is also in 1940, but this was June 1940. The other one was December 1940. And Gene Autry, the singing cowboy, is cutting the ribbon there in this particular case because it is Hollywood. They don't want just a regular ribbon. They're using a film strip. So it's a 35 millimeter film strip ribbon. And on the left is Tom Keen, another cowboy. Um, later in 1954, you have another ribbon cutting here on the Hollywood freeway. And that's Bob Hope in the middle with the requisite oversized scissors. And uh, Bob Hope was, you know, the height of his master of ceremonies era, which he continued, you know, for the next few decades. Um, and he had some great quips because the Hollywood freeway, when it first opened, it was delayed by World War II. So the building of it uh, took a while. It went tens of millions of dollars over budget and people were just fed up with all the traffic. By the time it opened, it was a, a big relief. And, and by the way, this is 1954. So this connected downtown Los Angeles to the Valley. That was a big deal to uh, yes. go those 10 miles from downtown to Vineland. And so, uh, of course, Bob Hope lived in Toluca Lake right off Vineland for years. And uh, so he made some jokes about the fact that uh, he's going to miss um, the detours going to his house because, as he said, Seattle was so pretty this time of year. Uh, you know, the joke being that the detours took him so far north, he was in Seattle. Um, and then it, a, another joke he made at the um, ceremony was the fact that the freeway was delayed by the war a long time. He said, you know, in fact, the, the Confederates captured it twice. So, you know, Bob Hope, another big celebrity. It was Hollywood. It was the Hollywood freeway. They wanted to really do it up with these celebrities. Uh, you didn't have too many celebrities after the Hollywood freeway opened. Um, after that, it was all just about beauty queens and uh, different ways of cutting ribbons, different types of ribbons. Uh, the next picture completely captures the uh, the era of the 1960s. He had these leggy models. They were given these honorifics like Miss Freeway Link, Miss Simi Valley Freeway, Miss East Los Angeles Interchange. <laughs> I, mean, I, don't, these, I mean, they're like the clunkiest uh, titles you could possibly give. And what you see there is uh, <clears throat> Mayor Pat Brown cutting a ribbon for the San Monica Freeway. Uh, you can see the copy right there. Caltrans gave me this photo it's from 1962. And this was the uh, this was the segment of the Santa Monica Freeway that was open. Um, and the next picture is another segment opening where the freeway extended to La Cienega from downtown. This one's just like you could just you could do like a, a college essay on this photo. There's so much going on here from like this, the giant scissors, the where the placement is, the woman on the right who's waist level with these fully grown men. There's just too much going on here that you could psychoanalyze. Um, you, you've got this crazy leopard skin model on the right and Miss Auto Show there in the middle and fully dressed, mostly white guys, although you do see future mayor Tom Bradley there in the upper left, right behind Robert McClure. And if McClure sounds familiar, he was the guy whose name is behind the McClure Tunnel, which is the end of the Santa Monica Freeway the Western terminus where it leads into Pacific Coast Highway. And uh, the guy with the glasses is Pat Brown, who never missed a photo op to fly down to, from Sacramento uh, to open a freeway segment. So that's just how things were in the 1960s. Um, and then, you know, we've talked to uh, the next few photos. Um, I talked earlier about the fact that when freeways opened, they were, they were world famous. They were on postcards. 
This is the world famous four level interchange, which is where the Hollywood and Santa Ana and Harbor and a Royal Seiko Parkway all come together. So you have four different freeway names junctioning here. It was completed in 1954, right there in downtown. And um, when it first opened, it was it was portrayed on multiple postcards. Many of them are aerial shots. Uh, the next photo I love the most because um, it is of a family that is watching cars go through the four level. So this is the transition road from the 110 North to the 101 North. And they're just having basically like a little picnic. You get your very, you know, 50s, leave it to beaver kind of married couple there with their moody daughter in her bobby socks. And, you know, who doesn't want to just sit by the side of the freeway and watch, uh, you know, Studebakers or different cars go by. Um, the only problem with this photo is they're photoshopped in there. Because if you look at the car and then you look at the size of the family, they're like these 18 foot giants. Um, so I, I just think this is a funny photo. Um, also, that's illegal. You can't hang out by the side of the freeway and watch cars go by. It's not a spectator sport, but this was put together by the LA Tourism Board in 1956 as a way to promote freeways. And they just kind of slapped those people in there because why not? Um, and then, uh, you know, when, by 1970, I remember these postcards growing up, um, these uh, pictures of LA and freeways. And maybe I was a kid of the 70s in LA and maybe this influenced me to uh, think that freeways are really cool. I would sit in the back of my car. My parents would drive around. I would navigate in from the back seat to, um, I don't know, the beach or Dodger Stadium or a birthday party in Burbank. Wherever we were going, I would just get really psyched about opening, opening my Thomas Guide or my AAA maps and figuring out the routes in this pre-GPS world. And I even love the, the street lights of freeways. They're really funky looking and I have different classifications for them. I was, I was a weird kid. It made sense that I would write this book. Well, Later. I was I, I was curious when you said earlier. I was wondering what what started as a kid, but is that what started your fascination with freeways? I just um, yeah, I admired the the big columns, the the majestic futuristic look of them. The fact that there were no stoplights. The fact that you know freeways were fairly efficient in the seventies. I mean, yeah, there were traffic jams, but you generally could get in anywhere in Los Angeles in twenty to thirty minutes, as many people who might be longtime natives here probably remember. And I was just taken by them, you know, by the speed and efficiency, I guess. And, uh, you know, I had blocks that would create roadways in my house on my bedroom floor that I had road signs. As a kid, my mom got me road signs that I could then make my own little cities. I had my stop signs, my traffic lights, my yield sign. Um, so I don't know, it was just something spoke to me about them. Um, yeah. And then another postcard here, uh, which is coming up, the next shot, I love this one too, because the makers of these postcards, they were selling traffic and the complicated freeway system uh, as um, as a selling point for Los Angeles. Dig those crazy LA freeways. Uh, tell that to the people who got lost on freeways here. Um, there were multiple stories I came across of motorists who had never been to Los Angeles. One poor guy from Nebraska drove around for eight hours. He couldn't find his way off a of freeway. He was just going in circles and finally flagged down a CHP officer or another guy named Charles Morton or Greg Morton. And he got stuck in the middle of the Harbor freeway before there was a barrier there. There were just these raised medians. And he, he somehow found his way up on the median when he had to dodge a car and he veered to the left and he got stuck up there. He was up there for hours and no one would help him. No cops driving by would help him off. And he got so frustrated, he started sunbathing on the hood of his car. This was like in the 1950s. And um, just decided to chill out until some good Samaritan came by and helped him off the freeway. So, yeah, it was kind of a baptism by fire for a lot of drivers because freeways were new. They didn't know how to merge. Um, what were the rules? It was scary. And um, there were a lot of stories of uh, people who were one, one guy who just stopped his car in the middle of the road and they determined he had a new type of um, diagnosis. They, they diagnosed him with something called freeway neurosis, FN. And he was taken to a hospital. He just went catatonic. He, he was immobilized. He just stopped his, his car and then they helped him out of the car. And they, I think they determined he was just having a really bad day and he just kind of had it on yeah. the Hollywood freeway. And frankly, who, 
who hasn't wanted to do that? Just stop your car and <laughs> give up. <laughs> Turn track. Really? Is yeah. this a good is this a good time to ask why um we say the before you know the 101 or the 405? It's one of the first questions I'm asked when people know I've <laughs> written a book or when I was writing about freeways. You know, I say, like, oh, you have to talk about that. And it is a weird phenomenon that people in Southern California, because it's not just LA, but mostly Southern California will say, take the five to the 405 rather than take 405 to five, because mm -hmm. that's typically what you hear in other parts of our country. And that originated from the fact that when freeways were first built in the Los Angeles area, they were given names, the Ventura Freeway, the San Diego Freeway. Wow. And the reason they were given names was because it was easier than saying take, um, as an example, the Golden State Freeway that was laid, that was transposed over the the Highway 4, Highway 6, Highway 99. There are all these different highway designations that freeways would link up with. So rather than uttering all these highway um, numbers, excuse me, yeah, so rather than saying, oh, take US 99 to uh, Highway 6 to Highway 4, you just say take the Golden State Freeway. Um, eventually, one number was given to every freeway and so saying the golden state freeway we kept the the around when that changed to interstate five so the golden state freeway became the five because we just took the the never went away um the 405 <laughs> yeah i mean it, you know it's it, it's because we first called them by names mm -hmm. and the the stuck around that's cool so, yeah um, so I think that's, um, th that's kind of a little bit about the pageantry and, and, uh, grandeur of, of freeways. Um, of course, those are the freeways that were built that you just showed there and that we just talked about. One thing that everyone loves, and then I tried to, um, certainly devote some space to in my book are the freeways that were never built. And this to me is one of the most interesting aspects of freeway planning because in the 50s, there was this general sense that most Angelinos should not live more than four miles from any given freeway. And what that meant was creating 1,500 miles of freeways in Los Angeles County, excuse me, in Los Angeles. And so LA is 500 square miles, so 1,500 miles of freeways, that would be a lot of freeways. Eventually, we ended up with about 500 miles of freeways. This particular map is from the late 50s. And you can see down in the lower left there, it envisioned what the Los Angeles freeway system would look like in 1980. And the, the lines that are solid lines were freeways that were built. So you can see the 405 is a solid line kind of on the left there near the coast. And the Santa Monica freeway intersects that as a solid line. And then in the valley, you see the Ventura freeway was a solid line, you know, perpendicular to the San Diego freeway there. You have the five. I mean, most Angelinos will know these just from sight. You don't even need <laughs> to see the highway shields next to them. However, these dotted lines were never built. Um, they represent those freeways that I just talked about. So, for example, the uh, well, let's take along the coast there. You see that dotted line along the coast? That would have been the Pacific Coast Freeway. The Pacific Coast Freeway would have really just blazed over Pacific Coast Highway. And that was something that the high freeway planners wanted to do was to um, make a freeway along the coast from San Diego to Oxnard. Uh, same with Angeles Crest Highway. You don't see it on this map. You do see Angeles Crest Highway is that, you know, little wiggly highway there in the upper right corner. Um, that would have been an extension of the Glendale Freeway. Right. And then of course um i talked about the whitnell highway earlier that would have been the high the freeway excuse me the, the whitnell freeway would have gone through the midsection of the valley and you can see the dotted lines there um that go through the midsection of the valley there's actually two of them uh the whitnell would have been probably the upper one that was never built actually that's the simi valley freeway where your arrow is mm -hmm. that was built the 118 also known as the ronald reagan freeway dip just below that and that dotted line is the Whitnell freeway those people familiar with north hollywood and burbank will know that there was a Whitnell highway that was built that was graded because the freeway was supposed to go there that still exists to this day the Whitnell highway 
So it would have gone uh, west across the valley, and then it would have dipped in the very left part of the frame there. You can see where it dipped to go down to Malibu, it would have gone through the Santa Monica Mountains. And of course, the Simi Valley Freeway, at the time that this map was built, there was already a section that was already come, it was already adopted. It wasn't built yet, but the money was already there to build that, that uh, black line there. Um, the Marina Freeway, by the way, if you go just south of the Santa Monica Freeway there with the pointer right there, that section was already adopted, the little um, solid line. That's the section of the Marina Freeway, which we also know is SR90, extending from the 405 to essentially Lincoln Boulevard. Um, that entire dotted line would have been the Slauson part of it. Uh, so it would have been known as the Marina Slauson Freeway, cutting across five or six freeways and ending in Yorba Linda. Um, interestingly, it would have ended where President Richard Nixon uh, grew up. And for a time in the early 70s, the Marina Freeway was known as the Richard Nixon Freeway. The, the state uh, eventually stripped the freeway of his name when he was impeached, and it went back to the Marina Freeway. Had this whole thing been built, it would have been the Marina Slauson Freeway or the Slauson Freeway. And of course, speaking of freeways that were never built, the one that everyone loves to talk about is the Beverly Hills Freeway, which is this next map. And I would submit that Book Soup would not exist if the Beverly Hills Freeway were built. Um, this particular map, charts how it would have gone under Santa Monica Boulevard, essentially. So it would have been submerged. This particular route went from the San Diego freeway all the way connecting into Echo Park, where the two freeway currently ends. So it would have hooked up with the, um, with the, the two freeway, the Glendale freeway. Um, there was a route that was planned that would have run along Sunset Boulevard. And can you imagine that, like a freeway just running along Sunset, which is very windy. I'm not really sure how they would do that, but yeah. it would have gone through West Hollywood and gutted all of the Sunset Strip, including Book Soup. You'd have no whiskey, no- <laughs> I was gonna say, <laughs> you'd have no no Viper Room. All that history just wouldn't exist. It's, yeah, it's really it's nutty to think about. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, this was another example of West Hollywood residents, Beverly Hills residents, Bel Air, West LA, they're like, mm, ain't gonna happen. So um, it didn't, it would have been $300 million. Uh, the, the state did spend some money buying some properties because it, since 19, the 1950s, it was always on the books to be built up until 1975. It was actually uh, legislatively uh, deleted in the late 60s, but um, Governor Reagan kept vetoing that. And so every year it was still on the books, even though Caltrans knew they really weren't going to build it. Um, it really didn't officially go away to 1975, which is pretty late. And what it would have looked like, as I alluded to earlier, is this next um, diagram here. It probably would have been submerged, much of it. Um, and Book Soup was um, opened in 1975. Yeah, 1975. <laughs> and by the way, I went to school at West Hollywood Elementary, which is two blocks of Book Soup. And oh. um, that was kind of my hangout. I used to um, my friends and I would wander off campus to go to Sunbee Liquor or uh, um, Turner's, which is still there, and Book Soup. We probably didn't have much need for a bookstore when I was eight <laughs> or nine years old, but uh, that was like my hangout was the Sunset Strip there. Wow. Um, yeah, so this is just a, a rendering that Caltrans created to show what the freeway would look like if it was submerged. And you do have submerged freeways through the LA area. I mean, much of the Hollywood freeway is trenched through Hollywood parts of the 134 going through Glendale, for example. Um, the 101 also through downtown is known as the downtown slot. And um, so, you know, trench freeways, they do allow for more uh, of the community to remain intact. They're better than raised freeways in terms of like quality of life, but this certainly would have been incredibly disruptive. Um, now, I mentioned the Whitnell Freeway earlier, so we can return to that in this next photo here. This is something I just photoshopped for fun when I was creating the book. <laughs> this would uh, be wild. Yeah, right? So this is a very crude Photoshop. I'm not very good at that. But this is essentially what I think a freeway under the Hollywood sign would look like. Because the Whitnell would have gone up Highland, up Bronson, through the Hollywood sign, and then let out in the valley. So. 
all of the disruption aside, it would it would destroy the mystique of trying to find the Hollywood sign when you're in LA. You know, it's always it's always eluding yeah. everybody. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, uh, there'd be no reason to have GPS. You would just take this freeway and you're right there. Um, but uh, yeah, that this wouldn't yeah this wouldn't have been that disruptive, right? I mean, <laughs> crazy what what they this is all like um, 1950s 1960s. Everything started shifting by the late. 60s where um where once freeways were the panacea for traffic and they were sexy and people idolized them they really started to resent them and by the 70s there was a very acrimonious relationship between angelinos and freeways which uh we can also get to later um and this and, and speaking of those go-go years of of freeways this next um uh, rendering is the pacific coast freeway which i also mentioned earlier this is the section that would have connected from uh, Santa Monica to Malibu. And rather than running along the coast, there were serious plans to have the freeway go over Santa Monica Bay for six miles across the inlet, creating these man-made islands that would have been excavated out of the Santa Monica mountains and uh, just creating a patchwork of islands and running the freeway over the islands to the kind of promontory or cape of Malibu where it juts out. And this would have been, I mean, it's outrageous that this was even considered, but it was eventually shot down by the residents of Santa Monica. And um, it would have killed the beachfront in Santa Monica. You would have had um, no waves, for example. You would have had breakers. It, it would have almost created like another Marina del Rey because mm -hmm. you can see from this rendering, there would have been uh, boat docks and uh, um, there were, would have been parks and restaurants and things like that. So if you envision a Marina del Rey off the coast of Santa Monica, that's what this would have done. And this was just another example of, you know, just trying to get people from point A to point B at any means possible in the, in the quickest way possible. And that was what was the guiding force behind freeways um, in, in this era. And same with this last uh, rendering here, which would have been a tunnel proposed from the two freeway connecting with the high desert Palmdale Lancaster area. This was taken from the Los Angeles Times in uh, the late 50s. And um, you can see it's it was called the it would have been called the Angeles Crest Freeway, um, linking a long tunnel that would have been about 12 or 15 miles connecting with uh, the current 14 freeway, the Antelope Valley Freeway. Oh, bonus of this one, it would have been a great um, uh, evacuation route in the, in the event of a nuclear war. That's how it was pitched. Mm -hmm. And this actually got approved by the Senate uh, Transportation Committee, but it didn't make it to a full vote in the Senate, but it did get rubber stamped by the Transportation Committee. Um, so this would have been a tunnel that also, by the way, would have had a bullet train through it. So they were thinking well ahead here of where we eventually... <laughs> came to be with the bullet train. Um, so that's the tunnel that would have gone under the, um, really the San Gabriel mountains. Um, so that's kind of like, and there's just a couple other little things to talk about. Is there anything you wanted to discuss at this point in time? Well, we are almost at time for questions, but really quick, do you want to talk about some weird events? Yeah. Um, yeah. So the, uh, Really, what my book also covers is just the fact that uh, freeways have had, because they reflect Los Angeles, uh, freeways almost have taken on the personality of Angelinos. And the San Diego Freeway, this is an example of the big cut. The big cut was when the freeway was built through uh, the valley, the what we call Sepulveda Pass. Mm -hmm. And families would go to look at the big cut. It was the largest excavation project among highways in California history and everything about the San Diego freeway is epic and big from Carmageddon when it was, um, you know, shut down briefly in the 2010s for traffic uh, to the, um, the fire that you, you, I'm sure everyone remembers the, um, uh, the fire that was uh, a few years ago on both walls, both different uh, the Canyon walls of the, um, uh, this is a skirball fire is called of the San Diego freeway. Um, so everything ab about the freeway is kind of epic. Um, this other picture here is, so this was Millie. These were chickens that were along the 101 freeway where Vineland is. And these are known as Millie's chickens. 
because there were chickens that were fell off a poultry truck in 1969 and they ended up settling in the brush off the 101 freeway for about a decade they were seen there and they were fed by this re old retiree named millie millie bloomberg and um they had more chickens and uh chickens begat chickens and they were I remember as a kid seeing these chickens um, in the, not by the freeway, but chickens in that general area. Um, they eventually went away. I think they were all captured by the early 80s. Um, and of course, going back to the San Diego freeway, I was talking about how it's larger than life and everything about it is, you know, go big or go home. Um, it is, of course, also where OJ was uh, driving mostly on the San Diego freeway during his slow speed chase on June 17th, 1994, that was seen by about a hundred million people. And we all longtime natives here remember the Ford Bronco driving, just cruising along the San Diego freeway, heading up to Sunset Boulevard. And I have a large portion of my book devoted to how this all went down, how it was covered at the time, um, the people cheering him along the side of the freeway and from overpasses. Um, it really was a crazy time in Los Angeles and, uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, it's hard to describe, you know, just what that was like at the time, but that was probably the, the most focus other than the Rodney King beating, um, which didn't happen on the foothill freeway, but it happened outside just off it. Those are the two most iconic events related to freeways involving people of import, celebrities, what have you, two iconic moments, you know, Rodney King just leaving the 210 freeway in 1991 and, and getting beaten by LAPD. And then of course, OJ with his slow speed chase in 1994, um, where he eventually went back to his um, mansion in Brentwood. Um, some other weird things that happened, I'll just kind of leave with this photo. And I'm just showing this photo here because this has happened last week. <laughs> um, uh, there once were, seven thousand dollars worth of quarters that fell off the back of a Brinks truck and um that was on the hollywood freeway i think in the 70s well just last week thousands of bills fluttered off the back of a Brinks truck on the san diego freeway of course um and this was actually in the carlsbad section so it was like i-5 and people just stopped truckers people in their cars and of course they incriminated themselves by putting themselves in social media and sharing themselves, picking up thousands of dollars. Um, but this was just nutty. Uh, the, it was like an event out of it's a mad, 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 mad world. <laughs> and um, this I just came across as I was kind of putting this presentation together. It was, um, you know, it was it was trending on social media. And there's a lot of footage of these people just collecting these bills that fell off the back of a Brinks truck, to which I say you're a Brinks truck. Like if you can't secure the back of the truck, what good are you? Um, at, I don't know. I think um, they learned so <laughs> from the seventies, yeah. but yeah. Uh, yeah. So the, you know, the book has a lot of like sidebars and, and kind of fun little anecdotal things like this that, um, just to make it more fun to read. And, uh, yeah, so that's kind of, um, the lay of the land as it were, and I'm happy to take any questions. And that's just a little piece. So you definitely want to get your copy of Freewaytopia because there is much more in depth than this is just a little taste of the book. Right. Um, we do have a question that will coincide with your the, the last slides. So I'm going to go ahead and share them too, um, if you know, however you want to go through them. But we have a sure. question from Akash that's how do you see the freeways changing in the future? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, it's one that we're all grappling with. I don't think with the bill that's being pushed in Washington and where there will be money to kind of like break down freeways. I don't know if that will happen in the Los Angeles area because we are so reliant on them. Mm -hmm. um, I think we can only discourage people from taking existing freeways as much as possible. I think you're going to see a lot of um, congestion pricing. Um, you're going to see HOT lanes happening more and more express lanes. They're often called. And those are lanes where you, you know, pay to travel them. And, uh, you know, it's unfortunate because they're also known as like Lexus lanes. Those who can afford it will pay for them. But it does discourage people from driving freeways. If the traffic is so bad, you can only pay for them. Uh, so what you'll see probably are unfortunately more toll freeways, uh, more toll lanes. And um, what you'll also see, I think, are uh, so this is an example here of um, a cap park. If you go to the next picture too, Sam, 
Um, this is a park. This particular stretch goes over La Cañada Boulevard in La Cañada Flint Ridge. This park, right underneath it, is the freeway. And this is one of the only, I think it's the only capped park or lidded park over a freeway in the Los Angeles area. Now, there are others around the nation, but I could see a future like this where you could see there's a gazebo there. They have concerts. They have farmer's markets here. There's a kid's playground. And it's a, it only took a million dollars to build this in 2003. And it's like multiple multiple acres. So imagine in the next slide, if you did something like this uh, for the trench section of the 101 freeway going through Hollywood from Santa Monica Boulevard up to um, Hollywood Boulevard and you know, like a mile or so stretch there. And uh, so this when you're asking what's the future of freeways, I think part of that is how do we repair the communities, especially those dense lower income communities uh, where people have a worse quality of life because if you live near freeways, there is greater uh, incidence of asthma, respiratory diseases, even cancer. So by building more green belts and more green space, it's a way to kind of bridge and stitch together some of these neighborhoods that were ripped apart by freeways. Um, the last thing I'll say just on this topic is, uh, you know, I think you can make transit certainly more lower income. I mean, you can make it free or certainly lower the fares and make buses and um, and subways and light rail more attractive by doing that. And there is a pilot program now. My kids take subways all the time because they're of school age and they can ride them for free. And I think that's been very successful if you just show your student card. Now imagine that across every age. Now, maybe that's where we can use some of this infrastructure money toward bulking up our transit options so to make it more attractive for people. Yeah. Yeah. And um, let's see more questions. Um, would you classify the development of freeways as a success for LA or could it have been done better? And if so, how? Boy, you know, that's a loaded question because it's successful. <laughs> this is the, this is an example of what uh, the freeway planners were envisioning in the fifties. This was right around the time the monorail opened in Disneyland. <laughs> and the Alweg uh, Corporation Same. made a proposal of a monorail down the 101 freeway. You can see City Hall in the distance there. There are all sorts of monorails planned that never came to be. Um, but I think, you know, they were successful in that they let they helped serve those communities outside of L.A., you know, Encino, Pacoima, the South Bay, Santa Monica, Points East. Uh, the freeways opened up the suburbs, especially after World War II, when there was an influx of people coming here anyway. Uh, they were also successful in that they saved lives. Um, many freeways started, they originated in these trouble spots, often called blood alleys. As an example, where the 5 and 14 meet, as you're going to the Six Flags Magic Mountain or, you know, Palmdale, Lancaster, there's that giant interchange there, which fell a couple times from earthquakes in 1971 and 1994. But it used to be just Sepulveda Boulevard there linking with Sierra Highway. Uh, when that was, there was a point in the 60s where 47 people died just in that one intersection before the, before the freeway went through there uh, in the 60s. Um, there were other sections. Sepulveda Pass was extremely dangerous because Sepulveda Boulevard there was a windy road and people drove it too fast and had hairpin curves. Um, even the freeway going to Pasadena uh was was dangerous by um devil's devil's gate dam which is where the 210 goes uh from pasadena into la cañada flint ridge and la crescenta um that was a very dangerous section so um Cuenca pass is another example there were these dangerous passes and canyons that freeways when they were built minimized the number of deaths there um but of course this was at the expense there was a human cost of freeways being built mostly in the central and eastern section of the city, whereas people on the west side didn't have a lot of freeways in their backyard. So it was a double-edged sword. That's the way I would look at it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have another one from Ridge. What is it with freeways that do not connect? There are several freeway transitions that require driving through city streets. Yeah, that's a great question because so those who know LA's freeways in the valley, for example, if you're driving, you cannot connect from, let's say, the five north to um, or the five south to the 
134 West. So if you're leaving Burbank, you're taking the five South and you want to go 134 West to go to, let's say Sherman Oaks or something, there is no connector. Or if you're on the Hollywood freeway and let's say the 170 and you're going South and you want to connect with the 134, uh, with the 101. So if you're taking the 170 South going toward Hollywood and you want to get on the 101 West to go toward Encino, there is no connector there. A couple of these interchanges were built in the 60s and they didn't connect every direction. And in the case of um, those particular interchanges, I think what I came across was the highway planners thought that, well, mostly they were worried about, th they their biggest concern was getting people back to the suburbs and having connections going north. And some of the suburbs going south didn't connect all the way to freeways going east or west because it was really about uh, having enough traffic being served leaving Los Angeles and going to points north, west, east, et cetera. Um, so you mostly, if there were these truncated or non-existent off ramps or transition roads to other freeways, they were often going southward. I, I don't know if that's a great answer, but that in the case of the five and 134 connector that I mentioned, um, they were going to finish that. They just ran out of money. Um, so they decided just to do two transition roads and there were two more that were never built. And then by the 1970s, there was a lot of, you know, austerity in Washington and the state. There was inflation, um, environmental laws. It was getting harder and harder to build freeways. And then it became a non-starter to even finish that freeway. It has been resuscitated a few times by Caltrans, but there's never been the political will to get it done. Hmm. Yeah. I was, that's what I was, when I was looking at that map, the ones that are going across, I'm like, those might be more convenient, but then, you know, it wouldn't, maybe not be great for everything else. <laughs> yeah. And look, one reason you, you wouldn't do them now is because you'd have to displace homes. And that's just, exactly. again, that's a non-starter. Um, it, it's still being done. I mean, there's, there's, you know, certainly freeway still through eminent domain, um, kicking people out of their houses around the country. I know in Houston right now that, that, that made the news in the LA times a few days ago, there was a big article on that, but in the LA area, it just, it's, it's very rare to see that you'd have to, um, you know, you, it, it's, it's not politically expedient for anyone to start that conversation, start raising homes again. Um, yeah. so I think we're just kind of stuck with what we have. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, LA is so, um, so compact and so but i mean it's spread out compared to other cities but there's so many yeah. people that it doesn't feel like you, you and there's already so many buildings even smaller buildings it's just so jam-packed with so much that i don't see how you could change very much at this point no you, you you can't um and even widening freeways is frowned upon now because look what happened when we widened the 405 freeway in the 2010s mm -hmm. and i made that commute every day um it got worse traffic got worse when they added lanes really? uh the um, you know, that's, that goes to the uh, theory of latent demand. Mm -hmm. There will be drivers who will find a reason to drive now because they think there's another lane added to the freeway. Uh -huh. And so it doesn't really, it doesn't, in the short term, there's a depreciable difference where traffic starts flowing better, but then quickly it becomes the same or worse. And that's been proven time and again. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So I have one last question. Um, there is a lot of talk about people leaving California and is that in any way reflected in any increase or decrease in freeway traffic? I don't think it's reflected in any way of freeway traffic because I think we're already up to the pre pandemic levels on many of our freeways. And I think that's largely because the city of Los Angeles does keep growing. Uh, I, I don't think it's gone down. I know in California, there was a bit of an exodus of people going to other states, but it's not enough to make a dent on freeway traffic. I, I think if you so. were to like add up all the vehicles that you're taking off the road from people leaving the state, it might come out to 0.000001% or something like that. Yeah. So uh, yeah, you wouldn't notice a difference. I had a feeling of that. <laughs> people oh, always moving to LA. I know people always going to LA. It's always, and I'm always thinking, no, we don't need more people in LA, <laughs> but that's yeah. it. I mean, wasn't it fun driving the freeways during the beginning days of the pandemic? It felt like for me, it was a return to the way they probably were in the 1950s and how I remember freeways during the um, 1984 Olympics. How long when... did that last in the pandemic? I felt like traffic didn't 
it stayed almost the same. I felt like. Oh, early on it was, they were empty and yeah. remember it was a problem because there were a lot of people speeding and going over hundred miles an wow. hour racers along freeways. It got kind of scary uh, mm -hmm. to try these empty freeways after all, because you never knew who was creeping up behind you, like yeah. just trying to you. Um, but yeah, early on it was empty in the way that, uh, it was during the, the 84 Olympics when the city made a concerted effort to have to stagger work times for people going to jobs. They were encouraging people to drive off hours, stay off the freeways and the freeways are empty for a few weeks there during the 84 Olympics. That's wow. what it reminded me of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's almost after what you just said, it's like, it's almost like the traffic keeps you a little more safe because you're, <laughs> you're slow, kind of slow and you're in this compact space and you can't. <laughs> Yeah, and and I, I will add that freeways statistically are safer than surface streets because you don't have cross traffic. Mm -hmm. You don't have red lights and people running red lights. Um, everyone's going in the same direction generally. So the rule of thumb is for every mile of freeway that was built, you save one life from if that were a surface okay. street. And, uh, you know, the, the problem is, you know, when you're going at high speeds and then you do make a wrong, you know, you, you hit some sort of hazard or make a sudden move, that can be deadly. Um, but yeah, if you're just kind of going with the flow of traffic and going the same direction, they're safer. Yeah. 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 Now everyone just needs to embody more patience and stay off their phones and then it'll continue to be safer. <laughs> Correct. And don't, you know, you, you got to avoid getting freeway neuroses and getting catatonic and being taken to the hospital stranded in the freeway. Yeah. That guy like, must have had a panic yeah. attack. <laughs> yeah. He had a panic attack, I think. He also, <laughs> his dog had bitten his two daughters earlier that day. So like I said, he was having a bad day. Probably David. got yelled at by his boss too. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I hope he's okay. He was okay after that. <laughs> yeah. Well, Paul, thank you so much for joining us at Book Soup on Indy's first day. It is a special day for us. So it was a great time to have you. I, I'm honored you had me on this special day. And uh, may, you know, everyone have a um, sig alert free uh, rest of the night and weekend. Yes, everyone, thank you for joining us from home or wherever you are. Um, get your copy of Freeway Topia at the green button. And thank you so much for joining us and supporting independent bookstores. Have of a course, great rest of the weekend. Yeah. And thanks a lot.